everyone and welcome to our fourth mini lecture in the therapies unit. Today we're talking about cognitive therapies. So the cognitive therapies are a group of psychotherapies that focus on the cognitive aspects of behavior. So when previously we've been thinking about early life conflicts or subconscious conflicts um, or uh, modifying behaviors with no real regard to the, the thought process behind that, <clears throat> the cognitive therapies focus on those cognitive aspects of behavior, so how we're thinking about things. These therapies assume that problems are due to maladaptive thinking and that treatment techniques focus on re recognizing and altering, altering these unhealthy thinking patterns. So the four types of or branches of cognitive therapy we're talking about today are rational motive, cognitive, cognitive behavioral, and mindfulness-based therapies. So let's get into it with our discussion of rational motive. Uh, Albert Ellis is the pioneer of this approach. The main emphasis of this approach is identifying uh, difficulties that are caused by faulty expectations or irrational beliefs. So errors in the way that people are thinking about what's expected of them or errors in how that they are thinking of themselves. The goal is to disrupt those irrational beliefs and replace them with more rational beliefs. This relies on the ABC model. A is activating event occurs, B is subsequent beliefs about that event, and C is the uh, emotional consequences that follow. The idea here is that these irrational beliefs can lead to self-defeating behaviors and things like anxiety or disorders and depressive disorders and other psychological disorders. So let's look at an example of how that might work. Uh, in the example that your book uses of, uh, let's say, you're passed over for promotion at work, uh, the common sense view is that you're passed over for this promotion and as a result you become miserable and depressed. The way that the rational motive behavioral uh, therapy approach would look at this is the mediating factor here is beliefs. I must be successful at everything I do or am I a complete failure. I was not successful so I'm a worthless human being. So if you had a thought like that in reaction to the activating event, your consequence is going to be miserable and depressed. This model might sound sort of familiar. It's actually a lot like stuff we talked about with having an internal versus external locus of control or an optimistic versus pessimistic explanatory style for certain events. Obviously, the way that you think about things, the way you frame events that happen, and the way that you frame expectations, both of, of the world around you and for how you should perform, are going to influence the way you interpret events, right? One person might lose a job and say, well, I didn't like that job anyway it's time to find something new and something better. And someone else might say, this is because I am a failure. I, I deserve this thing and now I'm going to be miserable about it. So the emphasis on this sort of uh, approach is identifying these maladaptive beliefs and trying to replace them with something more adaptive. So here's some common irrational beliefs. I'm not gonna read this whole list to you, but things like feeling like you must be loved and appreciated by virtually everyone, or that you might need to rely on someone stronger than yourself. These could be irrational beliefs that could be leading people to become um, miserable or have maladaptive reactions to events. Uh, by replacing these with something more adaptive, um, the person might find more success. Okay, so let's move on to a discussion of Aaron Beck's brand of cognitive therapy. Um, this is a focus on changing the client's unrealistic and maladaptive beliefs. The emphasis here is on how a negative cognitive bias can distort perceptions and interpretations of events. So what someone following this type of therapy would want to do is try to identify automatic negative thoughts. So these things that happen quickly and automatically um, without real control, uh, negative appraisals of events. Uh, the belief here being that this is the cause of many psychological disorders, these automatic and negative uh, um, thoughts about events. So what the therapist does here is acts as a model and aims for collaborative therapeutic improvement. So instead of doing things entirely uh, yourself or relying on someone else to tell you how you should be thinking about things, you and the therapist would sort of work together to identify these negative patterns of thought, think about how they might not be rational, and think of ways to, to improve that. So you sort of work collaboratively instead of a one-sided relationship. So how does this process work? Uh, the therapist and client learn together to recognize and monitor uh, automatic thoughts. So they work together to sort of think about how um, the client is thinking about things um, and make some decisions about what is going on there. The therapist then asks the client to empirically test the validity of those assumptions and beliefs that are uncovered. 
So to use an example from uh, the previous table, let's say the client has uh, the expectation that they have to rely on other people to help them. They're not good enough to accomplish much of anything on their own. They always have to get somebody else to help them out. The therapist might say, well, is that always true? Um, how did you get here today? Or think of something uh, that you've done on your own. And the client might be able to come up with a list of things. Oh, well, yeah, I have done all these things myself and I got through this part of my life. That was pretty difficult. Uh, and I might say, well, so you see, that doesn't seem like a very valid assumption that you're that you're experiencing. You seem to think that you need other people to help you out, but you do plenty of things on your own. Uh, so by sort of trying to think their way through this to find a reason that these maladaptive beliefs might not be so accurate uh, as a way through. The therapist does this by creating a, the a climate of collaboration. So the client is encouraged, encouraged to contribute to the evaluation of logic and accuracy of those automatic thoughts. It's not the therapist sitting back and saying, um, here's what you're doing wrong. It's, it's a collaborative conversation of let's evaluate this together and, and think about how these things might not really be uh, the best way to go. Here are some examples of cognitive biases that might occur in um, someone with depression. So for example, there's arbitrary inference, which is the idea that uh, you can draw a negative conclusion when there's little or no evidence to support it. And the example that's given here is that um, Joan calls Jim to cancel their lunch date uh, because there's an important meeting, but Jim concludes she's probably going out to lunch with another man, right? So she is sort of, uh, or Jim is sort of uh, jumping to a conclusion here, drawing this arbitrary inference. There's not really a lot of information to conclude that on. It's just sort of a wild, uh, conclusion to jump to. Um, so having this cognitive bias or making the consistent error of making arbitrary influences and sort of assuming the worst can be something that can be identified and counteracted. Uh, likewise, overgeneralization is another example, making a sweeping global conclusion based on an isolated incident. And the example given here is that Tony spills coffee on his final exam, and despite all of his apologies to instructor, he cannot stop thinking about how big of a klutz he is, and now he's thinking he'll never be much good at anything because he's so clumsy. So taking one little example and drawing a sweeping conclusion, uh, making it more general than it needs to be. So um, rational motive behavioral therapy and cognitive theory, uh, therapy might seem pretty similar at first brush. And they are pretty similar in a lot of ways. There's this focus on rational beliefs, whereas in cognitive therapy, it's these distorted perceptions and interpretations, kind of same sort of idea, but um, nuance a little bit different. Um, the treatment techniques are uh, the biggest difference here, where in rational emotive behavioral therapy, it's very directive, so the therapist is trying to identify, logically dispute, and challenge those irrational beliefs, you know, sort of point that out for the client. Whereas under cognitive therapy, it's a directive collaboration. So while the therapist is still directing to some extent, they're directing a collaborative effort to sort of try to work together to test assumptions and correct the sort of thinking and perception. Um, the goal of therapy for REBT is the surrender of those irrational beliefs and absurd demands, sort of absolutist demands, letting those go. Whereas cognitive therapy aims for accurate and realistic perception of yourself, others, and external events. So let's talk a little bit about cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, this is exactly what it sounds like. It's a blending of cognitive techniques that we've talked about already this today and behavioral techniques, which we talked about last time. This is based on the assumption that thoughts, moods, and behaviors are all interrelated, right? We should address all of these aspects at once. This focuses on a very pragmatic approach, right? So it's goal oriented. You come in with a specific problem you want to try to fix and you work with a therapist to come up with a plan of uh, modifying your cognitions and modifying your behaviors to reach that goal. So you will employ um, similar techniques that we talked about earlier in this unit in terms of addressing um, the cognitive aspects and apply techniques uh, from the behavioral approach that we talked about last time. Um, this is a very effective form of therapy for a lot of people. It's effective across age groups for multiple disorders. So it works for young and old people and people on all, all, along the spectrum of many different disorders. Uh, another advantage is it tends to be very goal directed and um, sort of there's more of an endpoint in mind, right? With something like uh, an old traditional psychoanalysis type approach, um, there's not really uh, a, hard, a really structured endpoint in mind, whereas with cognitive behavioral therapy, it's very pragmatic and goal-focused.
So cognitive behavioral therapy represents the intersection of your thoughts, your emotions, and your behaviors. Uh, a combination of cognitive therapy, changing those irrational, self-defeating thoughts, and behavioral therapy, practicing more positive behaviors, relying on principles of uh, learning theory. It's widely used, and uh, the client is required to modify both their thoughts and their actions. So just to give a little example of how this might work, in a patient that's suffering from OCD, you might try to address the obsessions, right? A cognitive component. Um, you might, just, you might uh, have this person, have the client try to understand and internalize, this is due to my abnormal brain activity. Um, you know where all of these bad thoughts are coming from, let's think about it that way. And then for a behavioral modification, you might ask the client to wait 15 minutes before giving into that compulsion. Modify your behavior, delay doing this, and uh, this will help you cope. Okay, so the last thing that we're gonna talk about is uh, mindfulness-based therapy. Um, this is uh, a type of therapy that's similar to the others, but it involves a uh, presence-centered awareness and an emphasis on a lack of judgment. Uh, this technique targets thoughts and behaviors, much like cognitive behavioral therapy, but there's uh, some differences. Um, this implements goals to change the context in which thoughts are understood. So that, that might sound kind of complicated, but we'll break it down. The way that we can change the context in which thoughts are understood, the first goal is to observe and change the client's relationship to the maladaptive thoughts and emotions. So understand how the client is interacting with those maladaptive thoughts and emotions, where they're coming from, and sort of what the cause might be. Uh, this can be accomplished through a couple of different techniques. Uh, for example, decentering. This is the concept of identifying thoughts and emotions as passing events, rather than identifying them, uh, identifying with them and being shaped by them. So uh, this is sort of, uh, while the other therapies rely on changing the sort of nature of the thought itself, this is focused on changing the way that the person interacts with that thought. If you think about this negative thought as being, or a negative thought or a negative emotion as being a passing event, not something that represents you and not something that you should allow to shape you and just sort of letting it go on, um, you are able to lessen the impact of it. It also employs techniques such as mindfulness-based stress reduction, structured program of meditation, yoga and body practices, as well as group discussion to facilitate a reduction of stress and an increase in mindfulness. Uh, this is often blended with other approaches or elements of it are blended with other approaches, right? You might go in to see a cognitive behavioral therapist because you're having trouble adjusting to uh, some change in your life. Maybe you have a, uh, a new job or have gone through a divorce or something like that and you find yourself engaging in some negative behaviors and having some negative thoughts, you might go in and you know come up with a plan on how you can change what you're thinking and um, how to structure some behaviors to avoid some negative uh, behavioral patterns that you've been engaging in, avoiding drinking too much or something like that. Uh, and you also might be recommended to engage in some mindfulness stuff. Think about the thoughts in a different context or to engage in some stress reduction activities to meditate or something like that. Okay, so that is the end of our discussion on cognitive therapies. Uh, we'll see you next time.